you can usually tell when, when a bull breaks, like, it, you know, it, I, I'm usually drawn at that, that breaking point, which is somewhere between 40 and 60 yards. Like, and I've, sh- I've killed, I've killed two bulls at three yards. Yeah. That's, that's one awesome. From my, we have one from my knees in the wide open, like looking up at them, all five pins right there. And then um, one, I, I didn't even realize it like an idiot at midday, 12, 15, he bugled. I was having lunch, 25 mile an hour wind. I was like, had to be a dude, had to be. There's no alcohol, but it was, you know, September 16th, you know, so they're out roaming. And I just, I never said a word. Sat there and chewed at my sandwich for like three minutes and I heard it again. I'm like, that's a bull. Threw the sandwich down, threw my pack on cut a hundred yards bugled one time one bugle and he bugled back and in about three or four minutes like he he was pinned these are stories of outdoor adventure and expert advice from folks with calloused hands i'm james nash and this is the six ranch podcast The Six Ranch Podcast is brought to you by Sig Sauer. Sig is a leading provider and manufacturer of firearms, electro optics, ammunition, air guns, and suppressors. For over 250 years, Sig Sauer Inc. has evolved and thrived by blending American ingenuity, German engineering, and Swiss precision. Today, Sig Sauer is synonymous with industry leading quality and innovation which has made it the brand of choice amongst the U.S. military, the global defense community, law enforcement, competitive shooters, hunters, and responsible citizens. Sig Sauer is also a premier provider of elite firearms instruction and tactical training at the Sig Sauer Academy located in New Hampshire. For more information about Sig Sauer and its complete line of products, visit SigSauer.com. We have with us today, Les Welch, who is honestly like a completely undercover killer and guide. And, uh, you know, Les and I met at Total Archer Challenge a few years ago. I think it was the first time we met. Maybe it shows before that. Um, But on that course, I remember we were going around, we were hanging up like bugles and elk calls and um, hats and stuff for, for whoever came behind us to pick them up and have a good day. Uh, And you were calling a little bit and I was, like seriously impressed you're a very talented caller kind of um atypical for an eastern guy that hunts whitetails an awful lot but gosh i got that elk bug and it's fun i enjoy it so people around here you know around wisconsin probably get pretty sick of listening to my bugle year round what is your uh what is your hunting background and and kind of how do you fit into the hunting industry so i'm kind of getting up there in age so i'm um middle actually even later forties now, but I've been doing it since I was three years old. My dad has taken me out in the woods here in Wisconsin. And so obviously grew up, you know, squirrels, eight, 10 years old and deer when 12 years old in Wisconsin, back in the day when it was legal and then flipped into turkeys at 17. And my first, you know, uh, Wisconsin bear was at 18 years old here. And then it's just progressed. And I never got the Western bug much. Um, A good friend of mine, Sam had been out West from, Wisconsin here a few times and I just remember the switch flipping one day and I was like I'm gonna go elk hunting and like when I do something I'm all in whether it's fitness work play um so I was I researched it for two and a half years before I made my first trip and I started buying gear right away I tried to buy the best right off the you know the get-go and um man so my first antelope trip was 07 my first mule deer trip was 08 and this was all setting up for that first elk trip in 09 and um yeah so i went to western idaho with sam and uh <laughs> we did a lot wrong but um i didn't manage to kill a bull the first night five point bull um idaho over the counter public land um super cool called him in so it's just it's been a bug and i will never miss a september in the mountains even if i live here in wisconsin forever which isn't going to happen but um yeah i just absolutely love elk in the mountains with archery gear it's my favorite thing cool how does your background in whitetail influence the way you hunt elk? I learned a lot of patience, um, which is, I'm going to go both sides of that here. I learned a lot of patience in Wisconsin because all I've ever hunted is public land for the most part. I've had a little bit of Kansas, 
Um, a buddy in Kansas where I was able to hunt some private land for deer for a couple of years. But even when I, when I travel for whitetails, Iowa, um, for the most part, Kansas, Missouri, Nebraska, Wisconsin, Minnesota, South Dakota, North Dakota, it doesn't matter. It's always been public land. So you learn patience and how to work around people and actually use people, not in the sense of using them, but use them to maneuver the animals and, and just understand what they do. So there's both sides. Um, I actually hunt elk a lot like I do whitetail or whitetail a lot like I do elk. Elk a lot like I hunt turkey. So yeah, a lot of patience, I, I guess, would be the, and woodsmen. I, I grew up hunting big woods in Wisconsin where Bayfield County's got 350,000 acres of public land and there's no fields. There's no agriculture, it's all big woods and that's what the mountains are, you just go roam. So I, I think woodmanship was a big portion of that too. Okay, well, let's let's be specific. Um, you say, you know, there's there's similarities between turkey, whitetail, and elk. Like, what would they actually be? So, you were mentioning some of the other people you're going to have coming up on the podcast here. And before, I've known Corey for a long time, Corey Jacobson, and I, I love Corey's attitude, and I hunt a lot like Corey does. That being said, I don't need to kill the biggest, baddest bull on the mountain. The one that trips my trigger and gives me an experience is much more fun to me than a number on the size of the antler. I don't I mean, we all want to shoot a 400 inch bull, but there's very few of us ever going to do that. So I'm after, it doesn't matter what I do. If it's fishing, hunting, working out, Ironman, it's an experience. If I'm not having fun, I ain't going to do it. So for me, the fun part of elk hunting is the interaction. Um, I've bugled in and killed bulls between September 1st and 4th, four, four different bulls. It's how I hunt. Now, granted, you have to scale that back, back and forth. Um, now, white tails, I've got a pile of big white tails that nobody's ever seen that I've called in. Like, I hunt white tails and elk very similarly. Um, I'm not an early season white tail hunter much anymore because I'm in the mountains in September. So, that third week of October through the third week of November, which is kind of prime white tail rut in the Midwest, I'm calling hard, just like I am elk hunting, just like I am turkey hunting. So I do a ton of setups for whitetail hunting, uh, whereas, you know, most people will hop in one of their two tree stands that they have and sit there from daylight to dark. And that's not my style. Um, and it's not my elk style either. I'm not a glasser. Uh, I know guys are good at it. Guys kill some really big, you know, Dan Evans, look at Dan. I mean, kill some giant bulls and those bulls never hear him make a peep. And to me, uh, that doesn't work for me. It's boring. That's not what I'm after. I know it works and it kills big bulls, but I want that experience with the interaction. So I get that with elk deer turkeys very similarly okay so in this this earlier part of the season we're talking about you know end of august first week of september um how does your style during this week of the season change from the other weeks of the season um it has to be dialed back definitely you, you have to scale it back because they're not super vocal they're not super active there's i mean I don't know what we're at the 25th or 26th of august right now and i know there's bulls bugling right now uh, i 100 guarantee it um, it's very dialed back, but one of my strategies, and I learned this from a guy, um, my elk hunting partner, if I, I either hunt solo or with one guy, Mike, um, quite a lot. Uh, he taught me a ton. He cut my learning curve in, uh, gosh, I, I'm going to say even worse than half, probably in a fourth, you know, um, he's a surveyor. So I, I learned to read maps really well. He taught me what to look for on a map. When you look at a map, I'll never forget him saying this. Oh gosh, over 10 years ago, he was like, when I look at a map, I see a 3D picture. All I saw was a bunch of freaking drunk lines. I didn't know what the hell they were. Right. Um, so, you know, looking at that map, I know what I'm going to do every morning when I leave camp. So I have a plan. I don't have elk scouted out. Like I said, I'm coming from Wisconsin and I'm going to Colorado, Montana, Idaho, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah. It doesn't matter where I'm going. Odds are I've never been there. And all my scouting is on Onyx or on maps that we create right here. So I know certain things we're looking for. We're looking for funnels, travel corridors, um, food, water, bedding, and then people. Where are people going to be? Where are people not going to be? And so I'll have all those on my maps and I'll have that all figured out. We'll have plan A through double Z. We'll have 50 plans. And sure, you start out in the morning at, you know, at the crack of daylight with a plan and a bull beagle is seven miles or, you know, 700 yards, you go that direction, your plan just change. But at any point in time, I can stop and look at a map and determine it's 1030 in the morning, thermals are switched. I don't have anything going on. I've got water over here. I've got a dark bedding. I'm going to get, I'm going to get above that dark bedding. I'm going to sit and I'm just going to be quiet for a half hour. I might, I might do some raking. I might do some like cow calls, a bugle. Um, 
it, it just really depends on the scenario. But yes, this early first week of what I would say the season for the most part, September anyways, is much more, it's the same exact thing, but it's on a much smaller scale, quieter, softer, um, less movement. Talk to me about raking, because I believe firmly that that is one of the most powerful tools that you can use. And it doesn't require a lot of skill, but there are ways to do it right. And there's ways to do it wrong. So talk me through that a little bit. You're a hundred percent right. I, I love raking and it is, it is very easy to do. You can pick up a branch and, and rake, but there's so many variables into that too. The intensity, the length of it. I, I walked into a scenario in Idaho last year. I had no clue. Um, I bugled, got a bugle and I cut the distance. I actually thought it was a hunter, but I cut the distance. And I stopped and I stood for 10 minutes, never made a sound. And I heard a bull raking. And I'm like, that's not a guy doing that. I knew right away it was a bull. And I knew he was raking. And I, I, I was on the same elevation of him. Thermals were good. With him raking, I knew I could move. And I started moving. And I walked right into three six points in a triangle, all three of them raking. It was the coolest thing I'd ever seen, actually. I never killed one of them. But we've got so many midday responses where, yeah, you'll bugle. And then you sit for 15 or 20 minutes. You don't hear nothing. Uh, rake. And then all of a sudden you get a bugle or you hear another bull rake in. It's, I think it's very underutilized and maybe we shouldn't even be talking about it right now. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I do feel like that sometimes, you know, I, I see, you know, I come from a, a ranching background and I see a lot of similarities between bovine moo cow bulls and bull elk, bull Cape oh. Buffalo. Um, doesn't really matter what the species is when when they get flooded with testosterone, we, we all kind of act the same way, humans included. Right. And, you know, if I go out in, in a bull pasture and these bulls are all relaxed and they're laying around just, you know, swinging their tail and swatting at flies, and I paw at the dirt a little bit with my foot, all those bulls are going to get up on their feet. Um, and if one of those bulls is out there and, and he's digging and he's throwing dirt, um, those other bulls are watching him very, very closely. And it used to drive me crazy as a kid whenever I had to move bulls because you'd ride into this pasture and you'd start to move them a little bit. And they've been getting along out there for a month. And as soon as you move them a little bit, you just changed um, all of their personal space and they all have to reassert dominance and they would just start fighting with each other immediately. And it drove me crazy. I was like, you guys have been getting along. Like, what's the deal now? <laughs> um, just causing me frustration. But the reality is, uh, you know, these bulls, bull elk is what I'm talking about now, have their personal space. And one of the most just audacious and aggressive things another bull elk can do is come into their personal space and rake on a tree. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're, they're obligated to respond to that. They are. And it's so fun to watch. And it's just, I don't want to say random because it's very specific, like you said, but it's just sometimes it's random when it happens and you're just like, it, it is. It, it, when it happens, like it's, it's going, it's on, something's going to happen. And I, I love it. When I hear a bull raking, something's about to happen. Another thing with that is that when he's raking, his eyes are closed. His um, eyes are closed or rolled back in his head and yeah. you should be killing that bull. Yeah. So if they're raking, you can, you can walk right towards them because their eyes are closed. They can't hear, um, you know, you've got the wind. Cause if you didn't, don't have the wind, he's gone anyways. Yep. Um, so that's a good time to move forward and close a little bit of distance. We were in Wyoming a couple of years ago and it was super late morning. We'd already had three or four encounters and this bull answered and he come and we cut distance and I was already tagged and the shooter, we'll just say the shooter, um, he hadn't killed a bull yet. And so, and it's funny because people are also different, you know, um, and whitetail guys tend to be less aggressive because they don't know how aggressive they can be. And he wasn't aggressive and I, but I couldn't see him. I lost him and that bull was raking. And I was like, you know, I was like, go right at him, go kill him, you know? And I stayed back to re-engage when he was done raking and like he disappeared and like, I can hear this bull raking and I can see the tree moving at 65 yards. So I'm just waiting to hear this arrow go off and like 10 to 12 minutes of raking and finally the bull stops and he like kind of looks around. He's like, what am I doing? I even, he didn't even know what he was doing. Like at that point, the bull had kind of forgot what was going on. And he, the guy never moved. He disappeared out of my sight at like 10 yards and he never moved. He's like, well, I didn't think I could go because I could see the bull. So for 12 minutes, he sat there and watched a bull rake and it 
he could have walked right up to him and killed him but it's yeah. it's, it's so fun to I, I love watching elk in their um environment you know like that it's so fun gosh well and like you're saying that that interaction with them makes them you know the best hunting species in the world um because they're does. they're a big beautiful animal they they're the way they live their lives makes them really hard to hunt. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just a tremendous experience to be able to, to communicate with them and get on their level and, and be an elk for a little while. Uh, it's to the point of, like, I would much rather be around someone who's not experienced and put him through the stuff that I know is going to happen that I've experienced. Like, I don't need to shoot an elk anymore. I've killed a lot of bulls and I, and I enjoy it. Don't get me wrong. I hope I kill one next week, but seeing somebody with a bull come up and 10 yards and scream in their face that's got drool and snots all over his face i mean i've seen people shoot five feet over their back 20 yards away and they have no idea what's going on like that's what we're talking about yeah i wear a um a heart rate monitor on my watch and a lot of times i'm you know in the in the 160s when i've yep. got an elk nearby and that that's just me calling, you know, that's me guiding. And yeah. uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't know if I've ever like actually had the presence of mind to go back and look at, at how fast my heart's going pitter patter when I've actually got a bow in my hand, but yeah, right. it's, it's probably similar to like having a heart attack or a stroke. I bet. I mean, one sixties is a, that's a, that's a good bike or a high run rate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we're standing still going, Oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, that's awesome. Okay. So, uh, what's your mix of like bull sounds and cow sounds this time of year, if you're calling. So it kind of, it doesn't kind of, it totally depends on the situation, but so I, I don't usually truck hunt too much. Um, pretty much backpack in anywhere from two to six miles, set up a camp. And I usually try to be close to elk. Um, you know, when I say close, I prefer to be within a half mile of where elk are going to bed. A cold camp, I've never ever had a fire in the woods while I'm hunting. So everything's quiet. So I really can roll out of the sleeping bag, get dressed. And at first light, I'm pretty much hunting right away. And it's location bugles constantly. Every, I mean, if people knew how I whitetail hunted, um, they would probably freak out. It's usually about every five to seven minutes. I go through the hardest rattling sequence you can imagine. I kind of switch gears there, but I'm kind of, I'll go back to why. Um, I use three different grunt tubes, a can call, and I literally smash my horns together. Like where if you miss, you're bruising the daylights out of fingers. Um, and I'll do that every five to seven minutes from November 1st, 2nd through the 6th or 7th in the Midwest. Because if you've ever seen a, a Midwest whitetail buck, on a mission in the rut his head is down and he's walking and he doesn't stop he'll stop every 150 to 200 yards he'll pick up his head up he'll look around and he goes back to what he's doing so i've watched those animals come 200 yards from the east and go 200 yards to the west and i know that quarter mile takes them four to five minutes and they're out of earshot already so if i if i can't see beyond 30 yards i have no idea what's going on so i know within every five minutes or so i need to be making noise and People would just, they would lose it if they actually heard this going on in the woods, but I've killed a majority of my big bucks. Come, They come in, tongue hanging out, ready, ears laid back, hair bristled up, they're ready to, you know, they're ready to pin it. Um, and so elk are very, I'm very similar the same way. So we're always dark timber. I don't ever glass. Like I never take a spotter. Um, always my binos. And a lot of times I'm using a rangefinder because I'm 40 yards and in, and I can tell through my rangefinder, I'm shooting or I'm not. So it's dark timber. I'm creeping pretty quiet. I'm not trying to be totally stealthy because if you know elk, they're not quiet. I'm not afraid to kick a, you know, to heal a dead log or to roll a rock down the, the mountain, but I'm not trying to make pack scraping noise. I'm trying to be silent, human silent, elk noisy. So back to the question, I guess, location bugles right away. As I'm going through timber, I will mew occasionally as I'm walking and it's literally probably every three to 400 yards I'm on location bugle but that three to 400 yards might be 20 to 30 minutes depending that time of year what time of the morning and exactly what's going on around me um nothing is set in stone I mean it, I, I might do three location bugles in five minutes if I'm not sure what's happening and it might be three in an hour depending but usually I would say every 20 to minutes um four to five hundred three to five hundred yards somewhere in there it just depends on the terrain and and stuff like that um since you're hunting off of uh your back are you bringing your camp with you and, and and hunting with camp on your back or is it a set location that you're hunting in that vicinity yep generally it's a set location um, i've hunted off my back only a couple of times 
going back to Mike and what he taught me, um, when, when we pick areas, like I'm looking at those maps and I'm studying them usually literally for, you know, 11 months, as soon as season's over, we're looking at, you know, the next plan. So I'm never going to put ourselves into a location that's got one drainage to hunt. If I'm going to pinwheel back in two, four, six miles, I want to have multiple sprockets to go and check things. So I'm going to set up a camp. We're going to have water. We're going to know where no one water is. And then, you know, we'll wheel out one day. And if it's good, you know, we'll stick with it. If it's not, we've got more directions to check. And it just allows me to go quicker, lighter, cover more ground. And I'm not a light hunter. I'm not the guy that's going to carry 32 pounds for a five-day hunt. I'm going to carry 65 pounds for a six-day hunt, probably. I don't want to carry that all day long with me. So it's easier for me just to set up and then hunt out and back every day. So you're planning on staying in that zone for the better part of a week. Yep. My thought is I take seven days worth of food. I can always stretch that to nine. If I'm really, if I've messed something up in seven days, I'm either killed an elk or determined there's not elk there. That's, it's not worth staying. So that's, that's more than enough time for me um, to decide what I need to do. Um, and if something's going on where, yeah, we, you know, the elk weren't there for three days. Now we've got into them or, you know, where we had to move camp a little bit. I can wheel back out and get a couple of days extra worth of food pretty quickly. But, but like I said, usually within seven days, we know we, we either got to really relocate or we're tagged out. Talk to me about your, uh, your equipment setup. Uh, what, anything specific? Like, are we talking arch, like the bow or the, yeah, let's talk about your, your bow arrow broadhead, um, sites, that, that kind of thing. And then we'll, we'll get into calls in a, another minute. Sure. So, I, I only live about an hour from Matthews. I've uh, been shooting Matthews since 91, 92 when they launched. Um, no Matt and those guys really well. Every year I literally buy flagship Matthews, flagship Hoyt, flagship Prime, flagship Bowtech, Bear. I have them all here. And we have little events here. I, you know, I got 19 3D targets so guys can come. They can shoot all the bows. I got a bunch of different Kafaro packs, IA packs, Mystery Ranch packs. I got all the packs here. You guys can try them out. I'm pretty solid on Sitka and Leupold, so I don't have any other clothing, but I got a lot of Sitka gear here, a lot of different Leupold optics, a um, couple of other optics manufacturers just to compare. Um, but for the most part, like, I guess I'm probably biased because I'm an hour away and I've known the guys at Matthews for decades, but I know Evan and those guys at Hoyt really well and in BA and Silver over at Prime and know really well too, and they're all good people, all good companies. Matthews to me has always just felt right. And that's what it is. So um, I'm this year I'm shooting the new V3, uh, the 31 incher, 72 pounds, 28 and a half inch draw length. I shoot, I shoot a light arrow, uh, 100 grain iron wheel outfitter on it. Um, 419 grain arrow. I don't, I don't really, I don't care about FOC. I know I'm going to get burnt on it. It doesn't bother me. I've shot length wise through three elk at 72 pounds with 419 grains. I know where to shoot and how to shoot. And um, that works fine for me. Um, guys want to run 600 grain arrows and worry about FOC. That's all the power to them. I just have other things to worry about. Yeah. That setup for the bow has worked great. I run an HHA four pin dial. So 20, 30, 40, 50. I've killed one elk at 48, but I've killed five elk inside of eight yards. So yep. it's usually top pin. Have you um, noticed that um, that there's kind of a zone that once elk get, get inside of it, that, uh, they're going to continue coming. Yeah. Yeah. It, you can usually tell when, when a bull breaks, like, it, you know, it, I, I'm usually drawn at that, that breaking point, which is somewhere between 40 and 60 yards. Like, and I've, sh I've killed, I've killed two bulls at three yards. Yeah. That's, That's one awesome. From my, well, yeah, one from my knees in the wide open, like looking up at them, all five pins right there. And then um, one, I, I didn't even realize it like an idiot at midday, 12, 15, he bugled. I was having lunch, 25 mile an hour wind. Like had to be a dude, had to be, there's no alcohol, but it was, you know, September 16th, you know, so they're out roaming. And I just, I never said a word, sat there and chewed in my sandwich for like three minutes. And I heard it again. I'm like, that's a bull. Threw the sandwich down, threw my pack on, cut a hundred yards, bugled one time, one bugle. And he bugled back. And in about three or four minutes, like he, he was pinned. If you've hunted turkeys, you know what they're like. A bull is, it blows me away when he'll bugle at 300 yards and I'll bugle at him, never say another word. Or even if it's a cow meal, he'll walk right to my feet. It just, I was stood on the trail and I saw him coming at like about 32, 35 yards. And I drew and I just waited and I waited. He stepped 
behind an aspen like this at about six yards and he continued to walk and when he stepped out he was at three yards and he never even it's it's so cool yeah when they break and they come it's like it's, it's one of the neatest things yeah your your arrow weight doesn't matter a lot at three yards <laughs> no um when cory used to have uh gosh extreme elk well, one of the bulls i killed at i don't know it's one of the mid-range bulls uh, like 16 or 17 yards we hounded that bull all morning on a drainage. We killed a 359 the day before. This is public in Colorado. And uh, we got that bull out. This is one, it was one of the coolest hunts ever. Um, Mike killed a 359, just a tank, big, beautiful bull. And when we got him dead and pulled up on X, we were 200 yards from a Jeep trail. So we creep crawled his truck back there, broke his bull down and creep crawled it back to our camp a few miles away. And then we got in the same herd the next morning. The herd, he broke, he broke from his cows to come and check us out. And the herd had no idea what happened. We were able to get him out. We kind of got back on that herd the next morning and I killed the satellite bull. But that bull, we worked him all morning, that whole herd. And they, they came from low, they were going, they were going back up bed to high to bed. And we were on one side of the drainage and he was on the other. And you know how a drainage goes when it goes up the mountain, it gets narrower and it gets shallower and eventually there's a head. I told Mike, I was like, well, we're just going to play this out. We're going to get to the head of this and something's going to happen. And sure enough, it's two and a half hours. We got down there and he couldn't take it. Mike was cow calling and, and he, Mike's got a nasty deep throated bugle and he hit him with that bugle and uh, he bugled back. We never said a word. I said, let's just sit and be quiet. 10 minutes. We sat there. We had lunch. The bull never said a word but he couldn't take it anymore all of a sudden you could hear rocks coming and he was only 200 yards away but he finally decided to make the break so mike he's coming and i've hunted with mike long enough and, and you'll know this if you hunt with a good partner for a long enough time like we just knew what we had to do we knew where the wind was we didn't even communicate we just looked and said elk and that was the last time i saw him and i, I moved down to catch the wind i knew where he was coming and i had an arrow knocked and i was watching and i saw the bull come up and I, Actually, it would have been one of the longer bulls I'd killed. It would have been 40 yards. And he'd come in through an opening, and I never saw it at all. I just, my cow called, stopped him, and I, I let the arrow go. And as soon as the arrow was gone, I just, I saw it. It hit a little branch, and it kicked up, and it went right across the top of his back. And as soon as I shot and saw what happened, I cow called, and I heard Mike cow call. I didn't even know where he was, but I heard him cow call, so I had a general location again. That bull ran 20 yards, and he stopped, and he turned back, and, oh, God girls they're, they're the demon man that's what was in his head he was like he heard the girls and he stopped and he turned and he looked and he come right at me i'd already had another arrow knocked i was i was ready at 30 yards i drew and he come and he couldn't see me when he got to 20 yards so he turned towards mike the second girl he heard and started walking and as soon as he and i still didn't know where mike was as soon as he went broadside and started i, I cow called and at like 16 yards i just pinwheeled him and he run about four or five yards and he stopped. Mike had sat down on a great big flat rock in the wide open and he pulled his little camera out and he filmed this whole thing and I had no idea. So when my arrow zipped through this elk, it was, it went three yards, like the bull was like three yards from Mike. Wow. So he got this whole thing and this bull like lunged right at him, turned and at five yards just did a couple of circles and, and died like within, he ran like 15 yards. That sounds awesome. It was, it was super cool. It was, it, like I said, it was two and a half hours that morning from daylight till 930 that we worked that same bull. So it was kind of a load off when it finally came together. It was, uh, it was probably the most, in, other than my son's hunt when he was just a little baby, um, probably the most emotional hunt I've been on. Like it was just a flood when that, when I saw that arrow hit him and he just, he went 10 yards. Like I said, he did a couple circles and he tipped over dead and like Mike was like right there. And it was, it was super cool, but that was just that whole thing of, you know, just, understanding elk and knowing what they're going to do and understanding topography really because if we didn't understand topography like we would have tried to cut down through this and that would have blown the whole herd out and yeah just uh there's a, so many different learning curves and stuff and I've, I've been really fortunate i've had a lot of good people teach me a lot of good things and and that's why i don't mind you know i, I love doing stuff like this if it helps one person a little bit it's 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 worth it it's fun that that barrier to entry is interesting to me um, and you coming from Wisconsin and, and then making this, this transition into becoming an elk guy, uh, that's a real, real big challenge. It's a huge hurdle for a lot of people. And a lot of people just kind of dream about going elk hunting or they aspire to go elk hunting, but 
Um, what does it take to, to just actually step out and, and get started? Man, that is the best question you can ask in this whole podcast. Seriously, it blows my mind how many people, exactly what you said, it's like a dream hunt. Ah, it's $200 round trip to Denver from Wisconsin. I can drive to Minneapolis. I can be in Denver. I can be ground to ground in two hours, 200 bucks. I can rent a car for 20, 30 bucks a day. You don't need chains and four wheel drive and all that stuff. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a nice thing. I think people get in their heads way too much. And that can be hunting. That can be personal relationships. That can be working out. It can be eating. It can be work. But I see it with elk hunting all the time. Like to me, I don't think it's, I don't think there's a person in this world that can't do this elk hunt. It's one week before season. And I don't think there's anybody who can't pack up their stuff. I've seen born and raised do it. They literally point on the map and say, we're going to go here. And they've never been there. It's there's more elk in Colorado than there is the rest of the States combined. I believe there's probably more people too, but I, I don't know. Life's too short to sit and wonder. And an elk hunt is really easy. I don't want to say killing elk is easy, but on the flip side, I don't understand why I think non-resident elk success is 10%. And I think overall elk success is less than 15. And to me, I, I, I do not understand that. I don't want to say killing elk is easy, but I don't think it's hard. I, I don't understand the reasoning why the success is so low. But then on the other hand, I see some people going through the woods and I'm like, okay, this is why. But when you can have a tremendously successful elk hunt without killing an elk. Absolutely. Um, two years ago, Wyoming, like I killed one bull. I had an Idaho tag. And like I said, it doesn't matter what I do, James. In life, if, if I'm doing something that's not fun, I need to reevaluate what I'm doing. Again, if it can be work, it can be play, it can be relationship, it can be fitness, working out, or it can be elk hunting. I had a great hunt. We killed five bulls in uh, two and a half weeks. And then I was like, okay, we're tagged out. I'm going to another state. I had a tag in another state and I was in there. Um, actually, we were there. Um, Mike went too. And we had a, just a crappy, crappy hunt. We were there for six or seven days. I think we heard like two bulls bugle. We put miles on. It was just terrible weather. Mike decided to go home. And then I had buddies coming from Wisconsin back to the other state. And I was like, I'm going to go home with you guys. Cause I know we're going to go kill some bulls. Like I know I can go get on some bulls and kill some bulls rather than sit here and spin my wheels by myself and not enjoy it. We went back and killed three bulls in four days there. It was just a hoot. Like I didn't pull the trigger. I packed meat. I took photos. I, I love taking photos anymore and calling, but we, we had two callers and two shooters on one setup that we had two bulls and we killed one should have killed the second. Got the, got the first one down, went and called in another one. And the, the guy missed them. One, half a mile later called in a third bull. I, I still get the, I get the shakes and the goosebumps right now thinking about it. And I didn't carry a bow at all. Yeah. That's awesome. That, and that's a great attitude. I also, you know, really respect that you're not getting, um, you're not getting ate up in the numbers thing because that's, it's yeah. such a destroyer of the quality of your experience. Um, so just, you know, I'm, and I'm not trying to take away anything from guys who, who care about a Boone or Crockett or Pope and Young score or how many times an elk has. Everybody has to define success for themselves. I just don't want you to let somebody else define success for you. Um, so you need to figure it out on your own and then go out and achieve that success and develop the skills and the knowledge and the tools that you need to do that. So speaking about tools, elk calls are kind of overwhelming. There's a lot of call companies out there. Each company makes a lot of calls and uh, in a diaphragm is a little bit difficult getting started to be able to use, you know, it's a foreign object in your mouth. Some people have a gag reflex. Um, and I certainly do sometimes as well, oddly enough, especially in the morning, like first thing in the morning, if I have to throw a, a read in my mouth, I might like burp up on it a little bit, but, uh, yeah. How do you even get started with that? Like I, you, you can't just buy them all. And that's, that's some common advice. It's like, Oh, just buy every single one of them and, and uh, see what works for you. And that's quite a bit of money. So what advice do you have for people who, uh, who are looking at, you know, trying out new calls or, you know, just getting started? That's, that's a good question. Like, so I, I mean, I was really fortunate. I got to meet Corey early in my elk hunting career, just through Sitka. 
Um, so, I, so I had that lead in, like I knew, it, I mean, you're talking about a world championship elk caller. So like, okay, whatever he's doing, but he could probably make a freaking water bottle sound good too. But, um, so I, you know, I had that, but then, you know, I got to meet, you know, born and raised guys and I got to meet Jason Phelps and, you know, Corey's dad, Rocky, and like, they all make good stuff. So I, I personally, where do you start? Maybe, you know, a buddy who's got the tubes you can use, or, you know, the external read calls you can use don't necessarily know that you want to share diaphragms, but if, if you got a buddy, I would say borrow some of those and try them at least see, or at least watch some of the different videos. Not that that's going to help you try them, but I, I don't know where to start with that. I, I guess, to be honest with you, I, I've, I got a lot of Jason stuff. I got a lot of Rocky stuff. Um, probably, probably that's the, definitely my two most. Um, I got some of Steve Chappelle's stuff works really well too. Um, I'm a read guy. Like, you won't if it's between dark and dark like daylight to daylight um you won't find me with a read in my mouth if there's a possibility that there's elk around if i'm sitting in a tent no but otherwise if i'm walking i have a read in my mouth and i have a secondary one sitting on my shoulder strap right here i'm a big read guy because i can do any any sound with it it's, it's handy i don't have to fumble for anything i do carry two or three external reads and probably 10 too many in my pack as well but i i live on the read diaphragm whichever and then um i don't know i've been using jason's tubes the last couple of years i just they got a bigger mouthpiece than rockies do for me that's a little bit better sound wise i've killed probably the same amount with jason's or rockies both either and they're both both great companies i guess just find what works for you how to do that i guess i don't know yeah yeah that for me the bugle tube doesn't it's not nearly as important as the read itself. Um, right. And and back in the day, like there weren't even like big bugle tubes available. So we were literally calling with, with bam, bam, baseball bats. Yep. And uh, I still do sometimes. So I've got a, a big blue, I mean, it's, it's, it's all taped up and I've got some like inner tubes and stuff around it to kind of deaden some sound the way I like, but um, it, it was, a, I'm pretty sure it was two ninety nine 99 at Safeway for, you know, bam, bam, <laughs> bat that I yeah. cut the cut both ends out of. And I'm, I, I can call very, very effectively with that. Now, do I use that all the time? No, certainly not. Um, there, there's a handful of different, different tubes that I use. Um, Liberty game calls has a really nice little rubber tube that I like. It's really soft. Um, but I think, I think to narrow this down for people, cause I want them to come out of it with some direction, like try, try a read from, say two or three companies that that right. is available at a store near you you try and shop local please if you can and uh, and then you can also come back and get resupplied as you need from those stores that are near you um, and then find the company that you like and then start messing around within that company and figure out if you know what read works for you the right. best you know you'll see on these packages it'll say like medium bull uh, old cow like that is such a bunch of crap like that. Yeah, they've got to put something on there to differentiate yeah. one from the next, but find the one that works for you. And you can make all the sounds with that call for the most part. Agreed. hundred percent. Yep. Totally. Yep. Totally. What are, uh, what are some mistakes you made early on that, uh, that you wish somebody would have come along and been like, Hey, Les, don't do that. <laughs> the, uh, so the very first elk hunt in Idaho, I made a buttload of mistakes and I still like, I'll tell people, like, I will tell everybody everything I've ever done wrong. So we drove from Wisconsin to Western Idaho, 27, 20, 24, 27 hours. I don't even remember right now. It felt like six weeks to get there. Now, granted, this is going to be my first elk hunt. So we were amped and, you know, it took what felt like two weeks to get there. Got there right before dark. We drove to the trailhead where we were planning on going. And I had spent literally two and a half years planning this hunt. And I had been on Onyx and every other thing, maps. And I knew where we were going to go put camp. Mistake number one, I've never been to Idaho. I've never been out west in the mountains. But I knew where I was going to go camp before I even got there. So we got to the trailhead. We looked around. We left. It was only 25 minutes to a small town, had a hotel. I'm like, you know what? Let's just go sit in the hotel. We'll take a good shower in the morning. Everything was packed up. We could have literally backpacked in the dark. We were ready to go. But we got our last good night's sleep. We showed up at the trailhead 20 minutes before daylight so we could get our pack shouldered up and start to hike. And there was elk bugling within the trailhead. But I made the decision that because we had camp picked out two and a half miles away, we were going to set up camp and then we'd worry about elk hunting. 
Well, that two and a half miles, James, took 14 hours to get to. <laughs> it was the worst hike of my life. And I will find you a picture. I'm not kidding you. My pack, what I shouldered up and put on my pack and with my chest rig was 117 pounds. <laughs> I had everything you could imagine, and I had planned and stand to that spot over here, two and a half miles away for 16 days, our entire elk hunt. I had enough food. I had a two-pound thing of peanut butter in my backpack, and uh, lo and behold, walked past two billion bulls to get to camp. Well, like I said, 14 hours later, basically a half hour before dark, we reached our X marks the spot to camp. One of the reasons we picked this spot was because there was a nice little lake there. We'd have fresh water. One problem, I've never seen a lake in my life I couldn't get to if I could see it. I could, you couldn't, it wasn't possible to get to this lake without ropes. It was down a hundred yards, it was straight rock. You couldn't, we couldn't get water. So the decision was made to either set up camp or try to hike back to the truck. I was like, I'm not gonna sit here, it makes no sense. So I literally took basically everything that was perishable out and chucked it for the bears left all my food there said i'm going back to the truck i don't care how long it takes me to get there i'm going to head towards the truck if i don't make it i'll set up camp somewhere but i'm not staying in here so anyways long story short headed back we got back to the truck after dark obviously um set up our tents in the parking lot of the trailhead so nice yeah 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 mistake number one was walking past elk mistake number two was having twice the weight on my back i've just learned to trim gear so much and what i've needed and i had good gear like I, I spent two and a half years researching gear i bought a western mountaineering bag two and a half pounds i you know that was with everything i had a um tent that was two pounds uh, i have the, I had the best gear i just had way too much of it I, I guess the biggest thing i'll say is never walk past elk if you know there's elk there that you want to hunt don't walk past them well one of the biggest things that they teach to to young officers in the marine corps is to be decisive and then the next thing they say is don't fall in love with your plan. And <laughs> the, those two things really go together in ways that you don't initially understand. So the first thing about being decisive is coming up with a plan and then beginning the execution of it. Like that's what being decisive is. Right. And you don't have to have a perfect plan. You have to have a plan that's 70% perfect that you can start right now. But the reason that you don't fall in love with your plan and you have to continue to be decisive is you have to update your information. And if something else comes along, then you need to get a divorce with your plan and then make a decision to start the new thing. And it, it's such a common mistake that you that you talked about there. And it's definitely one that, that I've made that I continue to make and all of us do because what we're imagining to be true, what we're kind of manifesting to be true, we want so badly that a lot of times we're willing to pass a better offer because we're more comfortable with a controlled failure than an uncertain success. Yep. Yep. And it, I kind of, if, if we'd back up somewhere 20 minutes or 25 minutes in this, um, I talked about that before. Like now it's to the point where like, when I get up, roll out of the sleeping bag, my packed pack for the morning, I'm ready to go. All I got to do is brush my teeth, really throw my pack on and go. I already have a plan unless that's changed overnight by hearing an elk in the middle of the night, I already have that plan in my head. I know what I'm going to do. So I start off and I know what my plan A, B, C, and D is going to be for the day, but I might not even be to A and this elk bugles or this guy comes in front of here, or I blow this herd this way. I'm already changing a plan. I'm not set anymore. I, I'm very good with my plan now, but I'm so much better at making a decision on the fly when I need to. And one of the biggest mistakes I, I I've seen this now since I've been, I'd say guiding people more is very indecisiveness. When it comes to elk, more elk live because people are indecisive than die. We could have killed seven bulls, one, one guy, like seven bulls in three days, if he would have been decisive and just, he might have effed some stuff up, but he went to effed up seven times. I might make the wrong decision, not even 50% of the time, but say 50% of the time, but I made a decision and I went. And half the time that works, probably more than half the time, I'd say three quarters of the time the decision works out. I might not kill an animal, but something happened positively. Whereas I, I've seen people just sit back and should I do, and I, I was there. I like, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Do it. Something's going to happen. What is, uh, what is your hunt schedule look like this year? Man, it's terrible. Like 
people won't even understand this because it doesn't sound logical. I have 213 applications in this year and I have one tag in my pocket and it's an eight minute Wyoming rifle antelope hunt right now. Yeah. So um, Idaho has their last turn back tag here on September 2nd. So I'm going to try to, there's probably going to be two to six tags that I'd be interested in. But last week there was 20, 2,800 people ahead of me for I think 1,200 tags or something. So I never got one. And I'm thinking there's only going to be five or six tags this next week. So it's probably going to be um, Colorado over the counter for archery elk. And then I'm going to probably get a B tag. I've never, I've never hunted with a rifle or elk. I, all my animals are with, archery gear. So um, I'm putting together a, I guess you just call it a long range rifle to take out and just have a little bit of fun. And so I want to probably find a cow tag out there because I already have used my A tag in the archery most likely. So go back out and do a little rifle hunt. I'm really looking forward to that as silly as it seems. Oh, and it's not silly at all. Um, And, you know, I'd offer a little bit of advice there is don't feel like because you're carrying a rifle that you have to hunt differently than if you're carrying a bow. Like it it has different capabilities, but that doesn't change the way you hunt unless you want it to, like you're still in control of how that hunt goes. Yeah. I'm actually, it's, I have a friend who has a goat tag in Colorado. Um, If I can make it for that would be really cool. But otherwise it's a cow tag with rifle is, is my most excited hunt I've had in a while. Yeah. It's so much fun. It's so much fun. And cows taste better, way better. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm super excited for it. And then I just got the, t- the typical whitetail stuff and there's the opportunity to pick up an Oregon or, um, you know, an elk tag there too, or something. So I'm not sure too much. It's just, it's an off year, so many applications and so many new hunters and. Well, it's the last year for it in Oregon. I know. I saw that. Yeah. Western Oregon still, of course, gets to do whatever they want because that's where our voting population is and they treat yep. Eastern Oregon like it's their own personal playground. But yeah, next year, all the good elk hunting for actual elk, not Roosevelt elk, but actual elk um, is going to be a controlled hunt. So it's going to be yeah. a different program, but right. uh, the tag allocations are still pretty generous. And I think people are going to draw at least for the first couple of years on their first choice, you know, at least 98, 99% of them will. I, man, I I applied in 16 States this year and I drew one tag. Um, And it, every, everybody's feeling that pain and we've been pushing recruitment, um, you know, reactivation retention for so long. Like that was the the silver bullet that was going to solve the problems for all these wildlife agencies uh, I hope that's the case because now we've got way too many hunters. We've got way right. too many hunters, or at least we've got a heck of a lot of them. So, you know, yep. the times that, that we grew up with where we could hunt every year, those times are gone and it's really expensive to do the types of applications that you and I are doing. Um, and Crazy. that's not something that, that we can expect people to do who are hunting recreationally and, you know, it, it isn't their livelihood. So I, I really feel for, for those folks who who are giving up something that, that for generations has, has felt like a right that they could go out and hunt elk every year. Um, and and that's just kind of gone now. Uh, and, and for a lot of species in a lot of States, but the good news is we've got a lot of new people coming in that are going to get to experience this, this, uh, this thing that we love so much. And, you know, thanks to you now they've got some good, fresh information on how to hunt for this week of the season. And if they keep hunting, you know what, next week, we're going to have some more fresh information that's going to be different. And it's been so interesting for me to talk to, uh, to talk to everybody that that is on this podcast series for the September, and what's similar and what's different. And uh, I think that the my biggest takeaway from this is that everybody has, uh, you know, a way that works for them. So I encourage people to, to try to explore their own creativity and, and find out what their own style is, but also just to get after it. Like, don't let this just be a dream that sits on the shelf. Like it, it's a doable thing. You, you can just go do it. it. It is. You're so right. I, I get so many PMs and, and questions about, you know, how do you do it from here? How do you do it from here? And like I said, like, I, I don't do it anymore. Like, I, I think I have a, I, I'm not after a 400 inch elk. If he walks by, I'm going to shoot him, but it's not my goal. I don't care to shoot the biggest bull in the county or the unit or whatever it is. 
so I don't make the scouting trips. I don't feel the need. I can sit down and look at a map and I can, I can find elk. Like I can be an elk the first day 99% of the time. And I'm comfortable with that. But if you're not, and you're going to go to Colorado or uh, it's 200 bucks. It, I've done it. I have, I've flown to Colorado. I've rented a car. I went on a three-day weekend. I went and I backpacked in, backpacked out, came back home. Three-day scouting trip. And you, you might not, you're not looking for elk because it's June, July, and August, not where you're going to be hunting the elk, but you can find last year's sign. You can find previous year's sign. You can tell where those elk are going to be. It is it is doable. Like there, I, Honestly, like I said before, I don't think there's anybody that's going to listen to this podcast that can't just go do it. Just pick a state, go do it. You don't need five people. You don't need 10 people. You can do it. I've killed as many solo bulls as I've killed with somebody. Um, yeah. It's a blast. And, and just to back up to what you said, everybody has got their own style. What works for me might not work for you, might not work for the guys next week. Um, the guys next week, uh, their style might not work for the following week and it might not work for me, but you just find it just like anything else, find what works for you and drive it home. For sure. And if you come across something, you know, there's some really experienced elk hunters that listen to this show. Um, if you come across something, you're like, that's not right. You know what? I, that, I know, I know that's not right. Just pump the brakes for a second and be like, it, that actually is, it worked for, it worked for this individual in that situation. And just keep that as a tool, because if you find yourself in that situation, if you've already shut yourself off to that tool, right. um, then, then you're not going to learn and you're not going to experience a new version of success there. So that, that's been really neat for me because there's a few things that, that people have, have said during the series that I'm like, mm, I don't think so. But I, I also need to check my own ego there and be like, okay, maybe I just need to hold on to this one just in case, kind of a, a rainy day type deal. Right. And, and that's, yeah. that's anything in life, man. Like for that's, sure. That's everything in life, you know? Yeah. Life's short. Get after it. Go have fun. Go find an elk to chase, educate yeah. him. Somebody else will kill him. And, and aspire to be as nice a guy as less is <laughs> like that. You're a world record holder in that regard. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Well, thank you for your time and, and, uh, good luck this season with the hunts that you do have. And, uh, yeah, don't, don't hold back. You know, if, if this is your year to go hunt a new, new state, just go do it, man. And, and if there's a way that I can help you, you, you let me know and I'll help. I'm in the same boat. And I, I'll tell people all the time, if you have my number and you want to call it, if I see it and I can, I'll answer it. And if not, send me an email or a DM and I'll try to answer them. And most of us are that way. I mean, everybody gets really busy, but the people are good people for the most part. Don't be afraid. Somebody helped us get where we're at. So yes, a lot of yeah. people. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. And we continue to help each other. And that's something that makes, yeah. makes me feel really privileged to be part of this community. It, it is. Yeah. It's one of my favorite things. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right, brother. We'll take care and thank you again. Absolutely. Thanks, James. I live in an old cabin with bad to non-existent insulation and wood heat. That cabin can see snow every month of the year and needs a good amount of firewood stacked in the woodshed to carry through the colder months. This spring, as my wood pile turned to smoke and ash, I noticed something metal pushing out of the decades of sawdust and bark. I kicked at it and unearthed a Stanley thermos. The cup was missing, and it showed more worn stainless steel than green. There were dents in the metal, and the handle looked like a puppy had chewed on it, but it still hadn't leaked the old coffee I could feel slosh inside. It took me back to memories of cutting firewood with my dad, waking up early for an elk hunt, or going out to the canyons to gather cattle. A Stanley thermos has the durability to survive whatever hard work you throw at it. You may find it carries memories as well as coffee. Learn more about their new and classic line of products at stanley1913.com or at your local sporting goods store. And catch you next week. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share the show with a friend. You can also rate the podcast and leave a review. Your support allows me to keep doing what I love, which is meeting incredible folks and sharing their stories with you. For more content and photos, follow the show on Instagram at Six Ranch Podcast or me at Six Ranch Outfitters. This episode was produced by Emily Brannigan with original music written and performed by Justin Hay. Art for the Six Ranch Podcast 
was created by John Chatelain and digitized by Celia Christofferson. Tune in every Monday for a brand new episode of the Six Ranch Podcast. I'll catch you next week.